Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today's speaker is Sahil Garg. He's a PhD candidate in the computer science department, advised by Professor Aram. And today he will tell us about efficient representations for natural language processing via hash function. Hi, so I guess uh, we can right, start with the topic. Uh, I worked with Aram uh, and one of the projects we have been working on is big mechanism. So that was kind of a starting point where uh, we were struggling with some problems getting condition extraction and that led us to uh, some of the novel algorithms in machine learning, uh, which have applicability for natural language but also outside. Uh, so we get into those details. Uh, so many people have contributed to this work. Uh, you could ask uh, some of them discussions. Some of them. So one a big aspect of this work is uh, focusing upon non-stationarity of data uh, that we encounter in machine learning in general. Uh, whenever we have some data, say some training data, and if the test data is completely different from it, uh, probably because uh, we have very little number of annotations, uh, or there is just natural drift in the distribution if you are considering temporal uh, scenario. Uh, so for those kind of scenarios, uh, you can imagine that whatever model you have learned, say some classification boundary, uh, then it's not going to be relevant for your test data. So you need to do some kind of domainal application as we did. Uh, domainal application is kind of more recent term that we use. Uh, traditionally in statistics, we refer to it as a non-stationary non in the data. Uh, and in natural language, uh, the phenomenon of non-stationary is even more stronger. It's encountered, encountered in different aspects. Uh, for instance, here what we have is we have abstracts from three different uh, papers on the topic of cancer. But if you read the text, uh, the text is very significant. So then the question is if I want to build some kind of model which is going to read literature, say, uh, on cancer, uh, and it has some training data, say, collecting hundreds of thousands of those papers, can it work uh, in a robust manner for? rest of the data, which can be of millions of items. Uh, so, so, so that is kind of one scenario where you encounter non stationarity natural language, uh, where basically your text is varying in terms of its distribution. Uh, but also, even when you're like reading one single sentence, uh, many times we see that uh, there are some tokens in the sentence which you kind of need to ignore, which are not really relevant for the conversation uh, or, or for whatever task you are given, suppose you are like reading the newspaper, you may be attending upon only particular paragraphs or parts of sentences as per what you are really looking for in the newspaper. Uh, so that is another aspect of non stationarity which we also refer to as attention model in a neural network community. So uh, in our work, uh, one of the tasks that we consider is structure prediction or bioinformation extraction. And their kernel methods have been uh, state-of-the-art methods so far. Uh, and uh, But we face some foundational issues with kernel methods. Uh, we, like solving those issues can really uh, improve kernel methods significantly in terms of scalability as well as uh, domain adaptation. Uh, so one of the issues with kernel method is that typically whenever you're using models like support vector machines, Gaussian processes, or k-nearest neighbors, uh, you need to compute this full kernel method. Uh, the kernel computation you can and number of training examples. If you have one million examples, you need to compute one million uh, uh, kernel metrics. And in natural language, that can be even more expensive because computing the similarity between two sentences is itself a dynamic problem. Uh, so and that is kind of one of the reasons that in natural language kernel methods were applied only for small data. It doesn't really scale directly. Uh, and the, another issue is that in case of kernel methods, the focus is on learning the classification boundary, or so like in case of regression problems, some regression uh, boundary. Uh, but you are uh, not really having good number of parameters in your kernel function. You are computing this kernel similarity, and after that, you are learning this classification boundary, and uh, that can be defined in terms of weight parameters implicitly. Uh, but as such, you don't really have good number of parameters in the kernel function. It's kind of uh, 
extreme scenario that in neural networks we have millions of parameters and internal we have very very few parameters two or three parameters typically in natural language so you want to include some more parameters to this work. and uh, so these are our contributions uh, along these lines uh, for the scalability we use the idea of locality and sensitive fashion uh, and also stochastic sampling by stochastic sampling i mean you are going to use only a uh, sub selection of your data for training of training of this whenever you are going to compute objective function in scale uh, and for the flexibility uh, we extend kernel functions uh, to a non stationary kernel uh, so that you can include more parameters for adaptability as per a given data set of phenomena and uh, further we don't want to restrict our model to classifiers like uh, support vector machines or kms neighbors so we do something where we map a given data to a representation explicitly uh, like a hash code we will talk about uh, and once you have that then you can use sophisticated classifiers like random because we know that in certain scenarios when you have very good features you can uh, use classifiers like random for very good success it's very fast and it's also accurate in, in case of primitive adaptation scenarios uh, and since this whole framework is about uh, non-parametric methods uh, and rely upon the data you can also uh, build some algorithms where you are sub-selecting the data as per a test set you may want to look upon different subsets of your training data so i will start with uh, one of the problems that was kind of the focal point uh, which led to these contributions so one of the uh, problem that we work upon in the big mechanism project in ISI is about uh, reading uh, literature on cancer. So we are supposed to read like literally millions of articles uh, and uh, build some model on cancer spine part. By biopathway, I mean basically some interactions between thousands of them. I won't go into those details. Uh, so, so like that's the basic idea. And from for us, uh, the, the primary focus is that given a sentence, uh, we have some tokens like the green ones uh, which can be considered as bio entities and then you have the blue tokens which are supposed to be uh, interaction types so there are some bio entities and they are interacting with each other and uh, you don't even really have a fixed list of these uh, entities or the interaction types so first you identify try to identify these and then having these identifications uh, you try to infer uh, interactions you, uh, and the basic idea is that given a sentence you are going to generate many such candidates. Uh, for instance, in this candidate, it's saying that GTP binds to GTP. Uh, and similarly, like uh, using permutation combinations, you can uh, generate all the candidates. And then you're supposed to do, say, binary classes, which of these candidates are true and which of these candidates are false. And you're going to use a sentence itself as a structured feature representation for doing that classification. Uh, and the difficult part about this problem is that uh, given a sentence, you can have any number of inferences, structure predictions. Uh, and the more and more information you will have in this, like more and more entities involved, the problem becomes uh, more difficult. Uh, so you cannot really uh, use something, say, like standard framework of structure prediction where you have a given sentence corresponding output. So this is one of the reasons why we formulated in this uh, binary classification task. And uh, there is some engineering involved in terms of how to generate features. Uh, for instance, uh, what we do in our case is that you have a sentence and you can either map it to a syntactic graph like Stanford dependencies on the left hand side, uh, or you can map it to uh, abstract minimum representation, AMR, uh, something that is being built in the NLP lab uh, by Kevin and uh, John. So here, for instance, if you take this example that class is binding with GTP. Uh, as it is mentioned in the sentence. Correspondingly, we can see those nodes in the graphs. On the left hand side, the information is not really very localized. So the entities are kind of spread out in the graph. Whereas in case of abstract meaning representation, uh, the entities are more localized. So like you can just focus upon that small subgraph for making your inference whether this interaction is true or not, whether uh, GTP and R surviving or not. But there are some challenges like in case of uh, AMRs, it's a lot of well developed technology. It's very fast in talk where uh, the accuracy numbers are not really great right now. Uh, and there, in fact, uh, because of those reasons, machine learning becomes even more difficult. Denoise your data or these representations for performing the task. 
So this is one example where basically as per a given sentence and the uh, annotations or like basically identification of all the interaction type modes and the proteins, uh, you correspondingly generate some hypotheses. For instance, here the hypothesis is that RAS is catalyzing binding between GTP. And this is a false hypothesis, but still like as per the hypothesis, you do some subgraph extraction and then you do some pre-processing. Uh, that's kind of the engineering step where so as to make sure that these protein nodes, entity nodes become leaf nodes and the interaction that become leaf nodes. And then you can process this graph for the classification. Similarly, you may have some other candidate, uh, like here it is positive, uh, valid candidate, valid hypothesis, where instead it is saying that source protein is catalyzing by the way. So basically you have these two graphs, positive and uh, one is valid and one is invalid. And as you can see, the difference between the two graphs is very small. On the left hand side, uh, shaded part that's different. And uh, our, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we can basically uh, just assume that we are supposed to do some classification of natural and structures. For instance, here you have these graphs, but you can also pre-process those graphs by doing some kind of traversal uh, into these sequences. And uh, these sequences are basically where you have uh, some token coming from the sentence and uh, its corresponding semantic label. Uh, so, so these are the corresponding negative and positive label uh, sequences that we're supposed to classify. So traditionally, the approach is, uh, one of the approaches is of using convolution colors. Uh, where basically we are going to uh, find subsequences between, between uh, these two sequences. For instance, the bold part is the matching subsequence. Uh, and uh, the basic idea of these kernel function is that you have this small, uh, big K function, convolution kernel that defines similarity between two sentences or sequences. Uh, and that itself is defined in terms of small K uh, or small C, which defines similarity between two uh, words, two tokens, or two duplicates. Uh, so you can control the behavior of this convolution kernel significantly by learning the right small k function, small c. Uh, and the idea is very basic as we can see like even uh, from your child could be given a task of finding subsequences of two terms or three terms if it was an exact match but once you start considering more sophisticated things like word vectors and more, it's a little more complicated. But still, uh, there are some foundational issues with the existing kernel approaches, even though these are state of the art for like the problems we consider, uh, there is scope for improvement. So one of the issues is that uh, there are not really enough number of parameters in this kernel. For instance, here you have only this lambda parameter that you can see, we have other parameters. So you need to uh, somehow intuitively introduce more parameters. Uh, and the second part is that when you are computing the similarity between these two uh, sequences, you are trying to account for similarity between everything. You are not really ignoring anything, uh, which is not very intuitive because in real life, when we, as for the task, whatever we do, like if, are, if we are having some conversation, uh, we kind of focus or attend upon parts of what is said. Uh, so, so we want something similar in this model. And that's kind of foundational uh, kind of uh, caveat with kernel functions. Like when I was having discussions with other people, say, who are uh, using rule based approaches or regular expressions, in case of regular expressions, you have the leverage of uh, skipping some part. You are basically just looking for the particular patterns. But as such, the kernel functions are accounting for everything. So you want something between parts. And that was also like the, the main thing uh, going on in the neural network models where it's uh, referred as uh, attention mode. So this is our, one of the contribution, uh, basically we uh, proposed non-stationary convolution kernel uh, for higher flexibility in the model. Uh, the basic idea is that, uh, first I will just explain like what does a stationary kernel mean. Uh, and here I have to say like when I'm talking about stationarity, it doesn't really uh, have to do something with time. It's more general uh, concept, especially when we are talking about stationary convolution. Uh, mathematically, you can say that if you have two vectors, xi and xj, uh, and if you are computing uh, kernel similarity between those two vectors, uh, the function is going to be stationary kernel if it is translation invariant. That is, you are just relying on the distance between the two vectors, difference rather than the individual vector. Uh, so, as an example, suppose if I say there are two words, 
boy for girl and suppose I'm saying similarity between boy and girl is one and also between girl and girl is one. But suppose there is some model where I say that there is similarity between girl and girl is G, something like that. And we have alphabets A to Z and for some of the alphabets B and B, the similarity G. So then it, it's, uh, it's going to become non uh, So that's one uh, way to think about it. Well, uh, I mean, under what circumstances the similarity between girl and girl is zero? Uh, so that is interesting. So basically, suppose uh, if your task is totally uh, gender biased, that it's not caring about any information suppose related to girls, uh, then uh, you just want to ignore that word in your data. That's one way to think about it. So in case of natural language kernels, the convolution kernels, uh, we know that here it's, it's represented as big K, basically defining similarity between two structures. And it's a function of small k, uh, which is defining similarity between tokens. Uh, and we say that if your small k is stationary, uh, it's a stationary kernel, then your big K is also stationary. And that's what people had used traditionally in the literature. Uh, however, if you extend your stationary uh, kernel uh, with any non-stationary extension, I'm going to talk about one of those, uh, then your uh, overall kernel similarity between sentences is stationary. And uh, that can be that can have some like interplayability also, like uh, like the example I gave. If you want to ignore some of the words, uh, then it's relevant to use a non But there are other types. So, for instance, here the idea is that uh, you have this small k uh, between i and j tokens, uh, and you can make it non-stationary by just multiplying it with some sigma function, which is just a non-negative function. Uh, you can think of it as some kind of weights you have assigned to your words, uh, or it, uh, and that will make it non-stationary. Or it, even if your kernel function is already non-stationary, still you can like further like introduce more kind of non-stationary. So this is one of the idea. For instance, here as per the graph, it would mean that you have defined your parameters on this H label. So with the idea of non-stationarity, for instance, like using this function. Uh, when you're si defining similarity between tuples of edge and node pair, uh, or like token and its semantic label, you can uh, define these parameters on the edge labels, the semantic labels. And if you're saying that those parameters are going to be binary, either zero or one, that correspondingly means that here you are going to ignore some parts of sequences. So like from our learned model, we found that whenever you encounter semantic label operator two or purpose, it's not relevant for the task. Because when I'm reading biotext, there is a lot of things being mentioned by the author uh, in the published paper, but uh, only some part, or we are only concerned about whether two proteins are interacting. So, so, so in that sense, it can be very useful. There are other kinds of motion I think I can explain after the talk, after we have time. So, so far we have talked about uh, extending kernel functions uh, with the idea of non-stationality, which allows us to have more parameters in the model, more flexibility, kind of uh, attention modeling, uh, it allows you. Uh, but still, there was the issue of scalability we had talked about, that when you are using models with four vector machines, uh, or k-nearest labels, you, as such, have the completion model, like you need to compute a full kernel. So how do we deal with that? So as per the literature, at least for k-nearest level models, we know that uh, k nearest neighbor models can be uh, like so. The k nearest neighbor graphs can be uh, computed approximately using the idea of locality sense detection. Uh, we will go more into the details, but the basic idea is that if you this is your feature space, uh, you can kind of partition it using some kind of hash function. Uh, where here it's like uh, some part of the space is assigned with value zero and the other is one, and you keep on doing that, and this way you can kind of partition your space into like small buckets for uh, localized reasons. And then whenever you are computing your nearest neighbors, you just uh, do it locally within your area. Or as another example, if you want to find your uh, nearest neighbor in the city, you are not going to compute your distance with respect to everybody. You can probably just compute distance with everybody in the code uh, of your house. Uh, so it's a similar kind of idea. And with this approach, uh, the number of kernel computations you need to uh, make is linear. So that's like significant cost reduction from quadratic to linear. Uh, and uh, in our case, uh, to optimize the kernel parameters uh, within this framework of kernel hashing based uh, k-nearest neighbor, uh, 
classifier, uh, we use this particular objective function. The basic idea is that uh, in your training data, whenever you have positives and positives, you are going to encourage higher similarity between those and uh, discourage similarity between the mismatching. For the negatives and negatives, we don't really uh, account for that. Something we found in natural language that it's not very good to uh, push too much to uh, like uh, make negatives dissimilar because they are already like, typically dissimilar. If you try to do that too much, it can uh, you can lose some of the value. So, and the, another idea was that like we had locality sensitive hashing for scalability, uh, but if you really want to optimize some parameter like large number of parameters, you don't want to use all of your training data for computing objects. And that could anyways like overhead. So you want to use some kind of stochastic approach in the neural community, we know like stochastic gradient is used. Uh, in our case, our parameters are like binary parameters or like even if it is, uh, 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 so like in our case, actually we cannot really compute gradients as such uh, for some particular reason. Uh, however, uh, if you're computing objective function, you uh, still want to like compute it in a stochastic way. So you're going to use subset of data. Uh, in case of k-nearest neural models, apparently, uh, if you just use a random subset of data, it's not going to make sense. Uh, you can imagine that you have this whole neighborhood graph, and now you're just picking subset of nodes or like just random houses in the city, and uh, that objective or uh, computing just uh, your objective on just random subset of uh, houses is not going to work. However, you can use this simple trick. You pick random houses, and then pick neighbors of those houses. And th that overall set is going to be your uh, random subset for computing object. So this is what we do here. Uh, and uh, for the evaluation, I mean, we use multiple data set and one of the data set actually we had annotated ourselves, uh, which captures, uh, especially the notion of non stationarity in bio domain, uh, the domain adaptation and all that. Uh, so the idea was that uh, there are like millions of articles on PubMed uh, and we picked 25 of those papers approximately uh, and annotated about 3,400 sentences for this bio task. Uh, and uh, the experimental setup is such that you are uh, basically generating all these candidates from the sentence and like annotating those as positive or negative. Uh, and since we are interested in extraction or structure prediction, we are just going to compute F1 score for the positive, which is like a standard literature. So these are some of the results uh, when we are using the uh, k-nearest neighbor models as our classifier uh, and uh, using hashing to make it robust, uh, but also using the idea of non ID. So on the right hand side, we have uh, neural models, LSTM and convolution LSTM. Uh, and actually for the PubMed data, especially the accuracy are not really that great with LSTM because uh, in domain adaptation scenario, it, it doesn't work. Uh, in case of k-nearest neighbor model and SVM, uh, k-nearest neighbor does good job here, but not SVM. Uh, but both approaches are not scalable because they need quadratic number of color computations. On the left hand side, uh, we have two approaches. The, the very left hand side is uh, k-nearest neighbor with stationary parameters, like not very very few parameters, uh, but using hashing, so it's very scalable. And the right one is also scalable, but it's using non stationary parameters. And within, between those two approaches, you can see that improvement is significant. So F1, mean F1 score increases from 40 to 7, and in the PubMed data set, it increases from 39. Uh, so this is, uh, so far, what we have talked about is that we have this k nearest neighbor based model, uh, and we apply the idea of non stationarity uh, for making it more flexible. Uh, and also, we had the idea of uh, uh, for scalability, we use stochastic subsampling as well as we used uh, hashing. Uh, now, the question is can we uh, generalize things? Can we somehow uh, not restrict ourselves to use KNS anymore? Uh, can we use kernel functions to build some kind of representations of these natural language structures uh, so that uh, those representations can be explicitly used as a feature vector? Uh, for instance, here, if you have some graph, can we map it to some kind of hash code? Because we are already using hashing for like k-nearest neighbor model, uh, and it's like scalable. So can we use that hash code as a feature vector itself, and then feed it to some kind of ensemble-based models so like random, uh, random forest model specifically? I'm saying because it's uh, very good for domain adaptation. For instance, if I'm going to represent my entire structure as a very large hash code, say hash code with 1,000 bits. So as such, those 1,000 bits may not like 
uh, match gross training and test data. However, if you're going to take subset of those grids, then there is higher chances of matching for those grids. So you can build multiple classifiers using subset of grids. And additional advantage is that uh, even after using the kernel functions, uh, you're using additional non-linearity that is coming from the right. So this was kind of the idea. I mean, it's kind of a very simple idea. Uh, like anybody could think about it uh, at, when you're working on this kind of problem. Uh, but the question is, how do you really make sure that your uh, these hash codes are efficient? Like whatever representation you're going to learn with hash function, that it's it's uh, useful for the task. So for that, we first have to understand a little bit about the idea of locality sensitive hashing because that's like the particular hash function we are using. What locality sensitive says is that data points which are similar with respect to each other as per some distance function, they should have high probability of the same hash code. And the data points which are like dissimilar, they should have low probability for the same hash code. So houses which are really far apart in the city they should have very low probability of belonging and the same zip code. So that's the, the, the fundamental uh, like uh, characteristics of local, locality sensitive hashing uh, functions. Uh, but for instance, here, uh, if you have two dimensions real space, uh, all you need to do is you just uh, draw some random boundaries, random hyperplanes, and you can partition this space into hash code. Like that's uh, going to be theoretically valid locality sensitive hash function. However, when you are relying upon data-driven approaches, like if your data is actually this particular manifold, the data is lying in this manifold, uh, then building hash function becomes more complicated. And, uh, so we will go into those details now. So one of the approach which I will explain and then we can like get some insights why it should work, uh, is that you have some data on the left-hand side, uh, say some unlabeled data, in fact, uh, and you just uh, pick some subset of it, like the gray dots on the left hand side. Uh, and we are going to use those gray dots for building hash functions. And the idea is simple. Out of those gray dots, just randomly pick a very, very small subset. Like here you pick four of five uh, dots uh, and assign blue label to them, like say positive label. And similarly, pick another five and assign negative label. And these labels have nothing to do with your actual class label. In your training. So far, we don't even have to concern about the training part. We are uh, kind of in an unsupervised way, we are building these hash function. So you have now these positive and negative artificial labels. And what you can do is you can learn any classifier on these labels, which is going to act as your hash function. Here, for instance, you are using k nearest neighbor, like a uh, base classifier using a first nearest neighbor. Uh, as you can see, the in the left, this one. The red, the blue dot is closer than the red dot, and that's why the hash width that is assigned is zero. Uh, however, for the same data point, uh, here the hash width is one because uh, the data that you are using to build the hash function has changed. So, so that's kind of the key part that whenever you are building this hash function, you pick very small subset of your data for building one single hash function. Uh, and since you're doing that subselection randomly, you are kind of building these randomized hash functions. However, uh, still they will respect the uh, data manifold because the, the function is learned on the data. So, so like you won't have the problem that we were seeing here. So you will build some hash function using this manifold space itself because you are learning hash functions based on the data. And uh, that's kind of what we had seen like in the existing uh, locality sensitive uh, hash functions like which are not data driven, the primary principle that is followed is the principle of randomization. That each hash function is going to be purely random and uh, so that whatever boundaries you are going to build in this city, uh, whatever some, some kind of landmark you choose and then you will build all these boundaries within the city, uh, most probably uh, the partitioning of the city would make sense. So even like, yeah. Uh, Sahil, just a curiosity question. So uh, locality sensitive hashing essentially originated for addressing sort of high-dimensional computational geometry. Yes. So when actually did uh, the thought process begin of applying these to NLP structure? Uh, who sort of, was it a decade ago or 15 years ago did people start thinking about this? So, this uh, so yeah, I mean, locality since you actually it kind of became more prominent like in 1998 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was used for, uh, Similarity search of objects at large scale. Uh, 
uh, and uh, in natural language, it was used for documents, uh, but like somewhat simpler hash function where you, you were not really using kernels or anything. Uh, you were just uh, seeing like uh, how many words are going to be common with the document, something like that. Nothing more sophisticated in terms of finding any grams or subsequent. Uh, so, so that's my understanding. Uh, but there, like you can use even the existing, like lots of hash functions are there. Uh, you could use existing ones. However, when it comes to kernelized hashing, this is something very recent. Uh, and this work was done back in 2009, 2012, from uh, one of the prime colleagues and Christian colleagues. Uh, so, but they applied it for images. And as for my understanding, probably you may be the first one who were actually yes. applying it for hashing of natural language structures. Mm -hmm. Some work on hashing of words, like just tokens, is actually done even in our uh, like NLP level Kevin, where it's used for translation and for like efficiently similar ways for communication. So this is one of the approach. And as you can see that the idea is very simple. You are going to subselect some data and do some kind of uh, then fit uh, your, uh, some classifier to that data, and that's going to act as your hash. Uh, as another example, you can even use support vector machines for building these hash functions, and very efficiently, because what you have is you have all these gray dots uh, that, going, that you're going to use to build these functions, and you're just going to randomly assign these blues and reds, and then you are fitting this SPM model. Uh, and support vector machines are anyway supposed to be like highly regularized, so you can control that. So you are basically learning hash function as a random XM model boundary. Uh, and it's going to be very, very fast because you have only like a constant number of data points. In our data set, if you guys like decide this example, uh, in our experiments, we don't use more than 20 data for building single hash. So it's super fast, you're going to build like thousands of hash. And uh, so this way, like you can, just like here, uh, we pick randomly some data points and we build these boundaries. Uh, and now you have this nice partition and you can keep on doing that. Uh, so now let's come to the learning part. Uh, how do we learn the hash codes as representations of natural language uh, that you can, uh, that's a relevant, that are relevant for your task. So you can do two kinds of learning. One is that uh, these gray dots that we had looked upon, can we subselect those gray dots, which is basically like an active learning problem in language, uh, basically, like, because the, the whole methodology is uh, non-parametric, you want to, find the most relevant data. Or one way of thinking about it is that uh, based upon the subselection of data, you are going to decide what should be attended in your sentence when you're map, going to map it to a hash code. For instance, if I'm going to generate hash code for a newspaper, and if my reference set has only sports section, uh, then everything else will be ignored. In so that's one intuitive way of thinking about it. And it's also like support vector machines, we look on support vectors, right, as, uh, as an active selection. So here instead you are doing it in the uh, kernelized framework. And another thing that you can optimize is the kernel parameter. Similarly, actually, uh, we are exploring uh, this model uh, with neural hash functions, because the idea is same that you have some random assignment of labels, uh, and then you are going to learn some boundary. The only challenge in case of neural networks is that can you somehow regularize it, I think. Uh, but there are some intuitions that it's supposed, if we know that LSTMs are somewhat like uh, Good models uh, for natural language that even uh, if you don't regularize it, it will somehow kind of respect the structure to the way the natural language data is, uh, then it should work. And we had some decent reading and results. Uh, and if you follow that idea, then actually, wherever you are applying neural network models, uh, you can uh, instead build hash functions using those neural models uh, so as to deal with issues like domain adaptation. So, for instance, here you like for, for different assignments, you can build these hash function boundaries. And you have again some partitioning. It's not like as nice partitioning as we were seeing before because some of the regions are small and big, uh, but still for some problems it could be done. And in case of neural models, uh, you don't really need to optimize on the sub selection of these gray dots uh, because you're not computing any kernel similarity. Uh, so that is kind of one advantage. Instead, what you can optimize is your architecture of neural networks itself. How many number of layers do you need or how many information you should have in the neural network? So, so far we have discussed like there are two different ways of, like many different ways of actually building these hash functions using either kernels uh, or neural networks. Uh, and uh, you want to optimize either like neural architecture or kernel parameters or the reference set. Uh, now let's get into the objective. Uh, how do we do that? So on the left hand side, what you have is you have the hash codes of your data, whatever sentence or something you have. And then you have the label assignments for it. 
class name inside. And what we are going to do is we are going to maximize mutual information between those hash codes. And that's our objective function. And the intuition, why we are using this objective function, one of the intuition is that in the literature, uh, mutual information objective has been used for feature selection problems. Like in uh, companies like Facebook, so one of the, my lab mate, he was uh, working in Facebook as an intern and there they had like uh, more than millions of features uh, in their data and they needed to do some kind of sub-selection uh, for efficient training, otherwise they couldn't even uh, do the training. Uh, so typically you get one of the like major uh, class of algorithm uh, is to maximize mutual information between your features and class names and you sub-select features. In our case, we're not doing any sub-selection of like hash code bits, uh, but basically learning the model itself that is mapping a given sentence to a hash code. So here you have this objective function of mutual information between codes and labels, and you can factor it into terms of uh, entropy on the labels minus the conditional entropy on labels. And now you can see that actually uh, computing entropy on labels is easy because it's just binary labels or some discrete variable. Or since it's fixed, you don't even need to compute that term. All you need to compute is a conditional entropy. And uh, one of the typical approaches for uh, uh, computing some kind of approximation of conditional entropy is to use uh, proposal distributions. Uh, so, so basically, I won't go into the detail, but in our case, basically, uh, we use random forest classifier itself uh, to compute a conditional distribution or condition, uh, probability of a label given a, given a hash code. And that can be uh, used uh, for computing the overall lower bound of this objective function. That can maximize either for optimizing the reference set or greedily for optimizing the negotiation. So these are some of the results uh, where we have support vector machines on the top, k nearest neighbor models. Uh, both models are like uh, expensive. Uh, they require a different number of kernel computations that can typically take like four or five days to train your model. Right now. Uh, and then you have more efficient models, LSTM and KLSHK, which will take like a few hours. Uh, and uh, in terms of accuracy, actually, uh, as you can see, LSTM doesn't really do a good job. Uh, we have like some previously published LSTM model by somebody, so results are only for biology data set. And in case of KLSHKNN, which is the approach we, were, we had discussed for before, uh, it is nice. Uh, it's like does as good a job as other models like SPM and KMS neighbor in most of the scenarios. Uh, but we wanted to extend it, right, uh, using random forest. So that is our model. Like we are using this hash course uh, with a classifier like random forest, and the accuracy numbers are significantly high. Here we are reporting the mean F1 score basically. Uh, and uh, so we are increasing from 45 to 55, and uh, in the other data set is increasing from 33 to 43. So one aspect of these results is that uh, for this data set PubMed, we have uh, divided the data set into 11 different parts uh, as test set. We are not really computing validation accuracy, so we consider one data set as test set and the rest for training. So, and that's why since the, the, the data distribution is significantly different across the test set, uh, your numbers over are very similar. So these are some further results that uh, if you are going to optimize your reference set using the objective function we have discussed. Uh, what kind of improvements do we see versus the scenario where you are just randomly subselecting some data as a reference set that you're going to use to build hash. Uh, so here what we are doing, for instance, here we can see that when your size of reference set is 100, uh, your F1 score increases from 48 to 50, but when you look in more detail, your precision, mean precision is actually increasing from 50 to 55, and uh, the recall is decreasing by one point. So similar kind of results are obtained for other data sets. And then we also try the idea of non-stationality, whether non uh, learning non session parameters is uh, helping on the, uh, the accuracy numbers. So for instance, in case of subsequence kernel, you can see that uh, the recall increases from 52 to 56 for the reference set, for the format data set. Uh, but one thing we observed is that the improvement with non stationary parameters was more significant when we were using KNS level model, especially under certain conditions. Uh, here, the endophone somehow itself is so robust that it's able to uh, uh, deal with uh, the, the noisy factors in the text, the non stationary. And also, the hash function implicitly are also do, uh, doing some kind of non stationary because they are, each hash function corresponds to looking for some patterns in your sentence. And then we also tried neural model, and uh, these results are preliminary, but it's kind of for one of the data set, it does a little bit better. 
from the current one, but it's still uh, being explored. And actually, when you remodel, you introduce more data, so you didn't have any computation constraints. Uh, and it was uh, the important part was that when we use other neural models like the standard neural models, then we don't really see good accuracy in these kinds of things. Uh, whereas when you are using neural code hashing functions, then you need to make So now we will get into uh, a related topic uh, where we are going to explore the use of hash functions itself, whatever we have built so far. What problem of dialogue modeling? Uh, and uh, we can either think of this, uh, so like one of the motivations is like therapeutic dialogue modeling where some patient is uh, say explaining whatever they are feeling, uh, say some patient suffering from depression and then the therapist is supposed to respond to something. As a starting point, we can even assume that you want to have discussion with somebody so as to just let the person express himself or herself. You may not have the expertise of like the, the medical expertise giving the feedback uh, and it's kind of, kind of said in the medical community that many times that's just enough. This, uh, a person just need somebody to listen to. So then the question was, could, could you build some kind of a model uh, where uh, your algorithm is kind of responding as per what the patient said, uh, and so that if he, 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 uh, the person keeps on speaking. Uh, there are multiple advantages. One is that uh, that kind of system could be used uh, in a semi-automated scenario. Uh, where it could kind of generate multiple possible choices to an actual therapist, uh, or it could be somehow used for evaluation of existing session, therapy sessions, uh, or even to generate the data, basically, uh, because uh, real world data set in uh, depression therapy is very limited. So, this is one of the problems. Uh, and in our case, uh, we found that hash fun uh, using hash functions for doing dialogue models. One of the new intuitive uh, framework. Uh, and the idea is this that you have some patient response, which can sometimes be very long. Like in our data set, patient response can vary from one single word up to 10,000. Uh, and then the therapist is supposed to respond, and therapist responses are typically small, one sentence long. Uh, so if a patient keeps on speaking for 10 minutes, do you like really want to capture every single detail in that response? Or do you do or want to do some kind of attention modeling or have some kind of more uh, compressed representation of what the patient said or whatever is relevant for the discussion between uh, the patient and therapist, uh, say as a hash code. Uh, and then uh, even for the therapist response, the, the, the challenge in these kind of scenarios of dialogue modeling is that uh, we don't know what is the right answer. If therapist has said, said this thing or that thing, what was the right thing? We don't really have any evaluation score. You could possibly like ask somebody to do like even medical expert, like can you just evaluate the session after the end of the session? But it, it would be very, very subjective because the only way of evaluating uh, whether the thing was right or wrong is that if the patient gets cured and that response may not be available even after 10 years. Even if it is available, you won't know what external factors were there in that. So uh, in that sense, uh, this dialogue modeling problem is somewhat of unsupervised nature, uh, which is why as a starting point, we thought, why not try your hash codes? And the idea is that instead of inferring the exact response of the therapist, we are going to infer just a hash code representation of that. Like, what should the response look like? Just the representation of that. And then, since these hash codes are binary, uh, you can easily map a given hash code to many responses in your test. So, using the hash model, you can easily like, like index a database of sentences and uh, efficiently search. And that's why we are specifically focusing on this hash code because it's binary representation. So you're going to uh, represent your patient response as a hash code, which is going to act as a feature, and the therapist response as multiple class labels. So then it's like a standard classification solver. We have seen before. It is that it's a uh, more uh, high dimension. So this is the objective function we use here. Like uh, just like previously, we were maximizing mutual information hash codes as feature and the class labels. Now we are maximizing mutual information between patient hash codes and therapist hash codes. Uh, and let me point out that uh, we are maximizing this mutual information during the training, not during the inference part. So it's not like that if patient said something, I will just say, say the same thing, because in that case, the mutual information is like very high. Uh, here, your patient and therapist responses are already given here. Text responses are already here. So you just need to map those to hash code. Uh, such that those hash codes have high mutual information. 
And the intuition is actually simply that uh, you, if you factor this term into information, it's a uh, entropy on the therapist hash course minus conditional entropy on the therapist. Hash. That means that you want to uh, make sure that the hash codes uh, of therapist are diverse so that you just don't uh, represent every response of therapist as just one single same kind of thing. So you have diversity there, which is ensuring quality of hash codes. Uh, but you also want to make sure that given patient hash code, you are able to infer like to the good influence of the therapist response. So that is uh, from the conditional entropy. Uh, the tricky part is that computing this objective function uh, is definitely difficult, just like previously. But even finding a lower bound for this is difficult. In previously, we had just ignored the entropy term on the labels because labels are fixed. But in this case, we cannot do that. And the hash codes are also very high dimensional. So uh, building a bound on these terms is uh, typically, you cannot use the standard approaches for building a bound uh, for, for like tractable optimization. So what we do is uh, we build this particular bound. We won't be able to go into the details. Uh, basically, what you have here is uh, you have the first term, which is saying that maximize marginal entropy on each of the hash code bits. Uh, and the second term is to make sure that you have a good influence of each of the hash code bits of therapist, given patient uh, hash codes as features. And then the third term in the lower bound is making sure that your hash code bits are not given length. Uh, and this third term is actually very difficult to compute as such. Uh, but uh, we use Codex model, which many of us probably know in ISI, uh, which basically what it does is that uh, it's going to learn some latent representation uh, of your hash codes so that it can explain the maximum redundancy between those hash codes through that latent representation. So that's the basic idea of building this bound. Uh, and these are some of the results. Uh, the results are two, we do two kinds of evaluation. Uh, the primary evaluation is uh, the, the quantitative evaluation in terms of uh, metrics based on hash codes itself. So like we have this mutual information lower bound objective and we can build it another uh, function based on upper bound of entropy. Uh, so you can use those as the evaluation metrics here. Uh, so not going into too much details, uh, basically you have this kernel-based hashing model and also neural-based hashing model. And then you have different sizes of the reference set. Uh, if you are picking your reference set randomly, uh, then in the dialogue modeling problem, your bound can be of very low value here actually. Especially like when you're, if you're using only 30 examples for the mean hash functions. Uh, but if you're optimizing it, then it increases in uh, And similarly, here, if you just want to focus upon just the quality of hash codes uh, as a representation uh, of the responses, uh, you can do that by uh, computing upper bound of the joint entropy term. Uh, and similarly, here, like if uh, the optimized one has much higher entropy than the random one, and we want very high entropy. So these are like some of the results and uh, this may make more sense. So like uh, this is more qualitative uh, analysis uh, where we had uh, these black responses from patient and corresponding the blue ones are what actually the therapist said. And then we also generate the responses from over there. And in psychiatry, it's kind of very difficult as you will see there if you look on the responses uh, to decide what is the right response. And even the responses may not like have any common words or anything. So like here, if you see patient says run away and be by myself. So he's really talking about something very drastic and uh, therapist response is known. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and in our response, what we produce is a little bit different to who, oh, that doesn't pan out. I mean, to some extent, all the responses are making sense, uh, but it also shows that since all three responses from our system are so different from each other, uh, in terms of like their semantics, uh, it's not appropriate to use like traditional approaches, uh, traditional frameworks for dialogue modeling. Uh, where say you are using some blue score or something where you're basically just relying upon uh, word level similarity between the version data response on the ground. Uh, so that's why th that is one of the idea that you instead want to evaluate these in terms of hash codes. And uh, so this was like some of the preliminary results. So, so far what we have discussed is that uh, we looked into kernel based approaches and we had two significant issues, even though like they have been still state of the art for uh, some of the tasks like information extraction. Uh, so one of the issue was scalability uh, and uh, we resolved that problem to quite an extent using locality sensitive hashing and stochastic sampling. Uh, and also for flexibility, we had uh, non-stationary kernel. 
very simple ideas of normalization I think from machine learning, but introducing a parameter which kind of really makes sense for natural language, which kind of allows you to do attention modeling. Uh, for the future work, uh, so for, first of all, we are digging more into the idea of using neural networks also as hash function because that will uh, allow us to like use this whole framework for many tasks wherever we are using neural networks. And also from theoretical perspective, it's very interesting that uh, in neural networks, the function is so much non-linear and polynomial, so that un not so much regularized uh, can be theoretically proved that uh, some kind of non-linear random boundary feature space can act as a good hash function. Uh, so those are the things to explore in there. And it has also some relation to neuroscience, which I we can talk, talk offline. Uh, and another aspect we are kind of looking upon is the semi-supervision. Because effectively, when we, were build, when we were building those hash functions, you didn't really need the labels uh, for the data points which are in your reference. Uh, of course, you are using some, some other data, training data, set, labor data, for optimizing the objective function, uh, but not for the computing the hash function. Those could be done in, even in unsupervised way. So then uh, how can you use all of your unlabeled data effectively to generate like large number of good hash functions and probably as per your test set, you would want to do some kind of subselection. So those kind of directions we are pursuing. And for the flexibility, so far we use like some simpler way of introducing non-stitionality into kernels. There are some more sophisticated approaches for non-stitionality like this one process conversation, uh, very well known in the, the statistics literature. Uh, but that kind of approach, uh, the caveat is that uh, scalability would be difficult because you can effectively introduce like millions of parameters. Uh, and the question is also, do you really need that? So that's kind of it for my thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Uh, any questions? Thank you, it was a very interesting talk. So, Something that you mentioned at the end. Uh, well, uh, so you're computing the hash functions on an unsupervised way, and then you uh, you learn uh, what, how to use the labels then on your previous work, and not on the question answering work. So traditionally, locality sensitive hashing was is an unsupervised, unsupervised approach uh, because there the idea is that each hash function is going to be randomized. There are some approaches where you can instead like learn each hash function explicitly using the training data itself. But then the locality sensitive property may go away. So that was like the framework. Now in our case, uh, so as such for any data, you can still like use the framework in an unsupervised way. But if you want to enforce that your hash codes are relevant for a task, what you do is the hash functions is computed on the unsupervised data, but the data on which you are going to compute the hash codes, uh, they can be labeled. So as an example, suppose in the city, you pick 10 buildings as a landmark. And you don't have any labels for those buildings, right? And I'm saying that I will use those, those 10 buildings as landmark and uh, define some kind of boundaries. Like if somebody is uh, within 10 miles of distance of the downtown, then it's zero bit and other ways, one bit value, right? So this way, I suppose, uh, you use this unlabeled buildings uh, as a hash functions. Now to decide whether those are good or bad, uh, uh, or like the distance function and optimize those, <coughs> I will be computing the hash code actually for the houses in the city. Right? And those houses may have some kind of labels. I may have, suppose I have some kind of scenario where I want to decide uh, whether this house would buy uh, a heater or not, right? And that could possibly even depend upon like whether they're living close to the ocean or far away. Things, those kind of factors may be uh, uh, deciding that. And then uh, you are basically seeing like, what kind of, uh, I want to make sure that the hash codes uh, assigned to the houses which are close to the ocean are different from the hash code which are far away from motion because their labels are different consumer consuming patterns. So that is one example. But you're doing that you're doing the second one. You're using the labels and you're learning. You are using the labels, but for generating the hash function, building the hash function, you're still using unknown labels. So you're doing both. Okay. Because there's a I I I, I, I remember there's a body of work um, I think uh, it's called predictable hashing by David Forsyth through on Vision. And they use the, so they directly use the labels to to learn discriminative uh, hash functions. Yes. So, so I was wondering why why you didn't um, why why you use the mix? Yeah. So uh, there is a lot of stuff actually on supervised hashing, like even recently people are doing deep learning based hashing. 
But there, first of all, competition is going to be super expensive because you're building each hash function individually. And it's primarily done for the similarity search. In our case, we want to use hash codes as representations, right? Uh, so if I'm if my ultimate purpose is to build representations, uh, then I can, if some neural network is able to build some kind of hash code, uh, I could just use it middleware to prove directly root classification. Why would I map it to hash code first and then root? Uh, and the primary difference between all those approaches and our is that we are trying to make sure that it is locality sensitive hashing. That means data points which are similar with respect to each other as far as some distance function, it doesn't have to be the kernel function we are defined, uh, that they have the same hash code. Uh, and for that, we were using this principle of randomization, that each hash function is randomized. So in those approaches, you won't be able to ensure those kind of properties. So they will never refer to their works as a supervised locality sensitive hashing, it's typically referred to as hashing. And there is a lot of literature, but even those approaches have caveats in terms of that the optimization problems are highly non convex uh, and NP hard. So there are a lot of lots of approximation heuristics used when building those approaches. Okay, so that's all for today. Uh, thank you.